pituitary, and your estradiol, which is the estrogen level that is released from the ovaries. Those are the two hallmark hormone levels we check. When somebody is going through perimenopausal, I might check it at one point and it might show, oh, they're in the menopausal range. And two months later, they might be in the normal range, in the premenopausal range. So it's really not a definition. We don't define perimenopausal by the labs as much as by the patient's symptoms. Um, and certainly if you are having these symptoms or you're struggling with any of this, you definitely should reach out to your doctor. Was that a good introduction? Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. I apologize. I don't know if you noticed, I blipped in and out. This whole day has been a technology roller coaster, but hopefully I'm here to stay. My Wi-Fi, I think, keeps going out. So if it joins on a hotspot, hopefully that will work. So yes, thank you. I heard 90%, I think, of what you said, and that's perfect. I think you touched on all of the significant experiences that women um, will have from a physiological medical perspective. Um, also, I missed this part, but I imagine also you spoke about the, the other side effects related to mood, emotional, and all the psychological things that sometimes go along. I don't know if I missed that piece. I did. I did. I didn't really expand on it. Um, so the main the main reason most women come to see me, one is the irregularity of their bleeding, which obviously halakhically comes into play a lot. And also mood is a big issue. Um, there is definite a lot of studies showing that during the perimenopausal phase, a lot of women are um, feeling more mildly depressed, mildly anxious. Um, the fluctuations in the hormones definitely contribute just like the fluctuations in the hormones after a woman has a baby contributes to postpartum depression. The same is with uh, the perimenopausal and menopausal stage. Um, the, in terms of, I mean, I could get into the whole issues with bleeding. A lot of women do come because of the irregularity of the bleeding. Um, sometimes it's more frequent. Um, so what we define something that should be worrisome and be looked into by your doctor during this stage, if you are bleeding from, we consider a cycle first day of menses to the next first day of menses. If that cycle is less than 21 days, if you bleed greater than seven days of a menses, or you bleed in between your cycles, those are all three reasons to see your doctor and to have a workup. Because the big problem about this stage is that very often you are, might be only getting a period every two to three months, and it might not be an ovulatory cycle. It's what we call anovulation. And it's not like polycystic ovarian syndrome. It, that's a different. This is unique to perimenopause. And that anovulatory phase where you might not get a period in two, three months, you have a lot of circulating estrogen still. So it's stimulating your lining, but you're not ovulating. So you're not getting that after ovulation, that two weeks later, that menses, that period. So what could happen is you're at higher risk of getting what we call hyperplasia, which is a precancer precursor for uterine cancer. So suddenly somebody might not get a period for two, three months, which is very common in the perimenopausal stage. And then suddenly they'll start bleeding and they'll continue to bleed and they'll continue to bleed for about two weeks. And that definitely needs to be looked into. And majority, uh, most doctors would recommend an ultrasound and a biopsy to make sure you are not developing hyperplasia. Um, so these are all different anecdotes that we deal with in the perimenopausal stage. Okay, amazing. That's so helpful. We're going to dive into those a little bit more when we get to the questions. Um, let me just, in place of Shani, not that I could ever take her place, but since she hasn't joined us yet, I'm just going to pipe up with some of the, I guess, from a halachic and maybe hashkafic Jewish philosophical perspective, some of the things that as Yoatzot um, that we might deal with. Um, that we might hear about when speaking to women at this stage of life. So um, not surprisingly, it mirrors a lot of what Dr. Altman spoke about, um, specifically when it comes to issues related to bleeding, because that often is the first reason why a woman will um, either panic from a, from a medical perspective and also panic from a NIDA perspective, wondering what is happening. I wasn't expecting a period or I haven't had a period in three or four months. And now I'm bleeding. Sometimes they're bleeding for a day or two. But as you mentioned, Dr. Altman, sometimes they're 
bleeding for an extended period of time. And I think that never mind the hormonal cause of the up and down of the mood, but the not knowing what to expect, the anxiety um, of women of not having any clue of when a period is going to start and how long it's going to last and shorten cycles, lengthen cycles, all the things that go in um, into a typical perimenopausal experience, never mind one that's atypical, um, really would definitely cause a woman to reach out to her yoetzet, rabbi, postic, rebbetin, whoever it is that she speaks to. Um, and I will say that there's no... There, we, we never compare, right? We don't compare a woman who's dealing with NIDA related challenges in her 20s to the woman who's dealing with NIDA related challenges in her 40s. They're all going through a very difficult time. Um, sometimes it's a, you know, in the younger years, it might be a fertility related um, situation. And sometimes as the woman is getting older, it's not fertility related, but she is dealing with, you know, she's at the end of her fertile years and she's trying to navigate that. Um, all that is to say that the added layer of the halachic impact that all of these things have on a woman's life, and if that woman is married on on her marriage, um, are quite significant. And I think that is a unique role that a yoetzet can play in the life of a woman who is dealing with these challenges. Um, number one, by way of just offering some emotional support, some validation. Um, and of course, from a halachic perspective, trying to navigate what is often a very tricky, um, very thin line between what may, you know, what a woman, whether she is needs or whether she is not, depending on how much she's bleeding um, and you know the the different aspects of what's going on with her cycle. And so very often uh, the OSED or whoever the woman is speaking to is really having to be on top of what is typical and what is atypical, because the first thing we would want to do is refer to a doctor if we believe that that is um, you know, a necessary step. And it's never, never a bad thing to reach out and ask for medical advice. So that is definitely first and foremost in the US that's mind, hopefully, is to reach out and make sure that everything is okay on the medical side, keeping in mind all the things that Dr. Altman told us as to when we really want to encourage, sometimes we have to push a little strongly to get a woman to make an appointment. Um, and make sure that she gets seen. So, so that's one. So number one, you know, we're encouraging women to make sure that on the medical side, everything is the way it should be and that what she's experiencing is typical and standard, albeit unpleasant, but that it's typical and that it's standard. Um, number two, we're trying to offer emotional support, um, moral support, navigating this time. And then of course, we're also trying to offer halachic support, navigating the different um, aspects. I'll just make mention of a couple of things that come up from a halachic perspective. We mentioned bleeding already um, and unexpected bleeding. So then we're always looking at, you know, What's the source of the bleeding, of course, and if the woman has had a procedure, okay, but if it's just, you know, unexpected bleeding, then trying to figure out amounts and colors and all of that, which is um, often something that we discuss in great detail. And um, the other thing that tends to come up um, is the inability to, to plan, um, the inability to plan to get to the mikvah, the inability to plan of when the next, when a next period will be. And that's something that obviously whatever information we can gather, we try to help, but just, you know, being there trying to hold a woman's hands. And then finally, um, I'll make mention of the other thing which often comes up, I have found in speaking to women going through this stage of life, which as you mentioned, Dr. Altman, spans, menopause is like a, right, like a moment in time that happens after a year of, of being period free. But the years that could lead up to that, right, that can be quite extensive, four years, five years. Some women have shared with me that they were sure they were experiencing symptoms of menopause already in their mid forties and didn't really go through complete menopause till like 52, 53. So that's quite a number of years. Um, um, and with all of the with all of the symptoms that you mentioned, so a woman's the the dryness that she experiences, her sensitivity, her difficulty with um, arousal and pleasure, lower libido, those things tend to come up quite often. Never mind for these women also what at least in the experience that I've had, seems to be a shorter window of a woman being um, being tahora, going to the mikvah and being able to stay that way. Um, all of those things, lead to a real frustration and a lot of difficulty um, and frankly a lot of pain a lot of um, stress and tension between a couple uh, the woman herself not really being sure what's going on and of course in a marriage where hopefully the physical aspect of their relationship is prominent then trying to make sure i think dr Alman, you and i spoke about this before when we were planning for the session trying to make sure that a couple's whatever their sex life was like before this stage, at the very least, we're, we're, we're looking for maintenance. Um, always trying to keep in mind what was before perimenopause. We're not, it, 
chances are not necessarily so strong in massive improve, improvements in that area without also getting into a lot of support, um, which is available, but just always trying to maintain, you know, a, a realistic, you know, a, approach to what is possible. Um, and so, so from a halachic perspective, looking to support women, um, but that includes their health as well as their physical health, as well as their sexual health, which really, um, I think we'll talk about this more as we get through some of the questions, um, is something that comes up and is really significant. Um, okay, I see Shani is in the process of joining us. So I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Okay, um, Dr. Almond, is there anything you want to add, or should so, we? Jump yeah, well, you're just you touch on a few points. So, so you have to consider this new stage as you're going through. All women should consider it is going to be more than a you know life expectancy is mid 80s for women, um, and therefore you are a good, at least probably um probably about half of your sexual life is in menopause. So you definitely, I'm a firm believer of treating the symptoms early and not late. So if you are starting to have vaginal dryness in the perimenopausal stage, I feel bad to tell my patients, but it's not going to improve a few years down the line. So the best is to be proactive. Okay. Patients are very, very scared of taking medication. Um, you know, I, we could go into the whole thing. Vaginal estrogen is very different than oral estrogen. Vaginal estrogen for the, for just the vagina to treat the vaginal dryness. Um, what I often tell patients is do not, I, I tell them when you open up the, be it the Vagifem, which is a suppository that you put on the vagina, be it the vaginal creams that you might be prescribed. I say, take the medical pamphlet that's there and throw it out because it has all the risks listed as if you're taking hormone replacement, which is the oral, which is fine too, um, but that has a little more complications or a little more side effects than the vaginal estrogen. So I tell patients, throw out the pamphlet. Don't even look at it because they give you all the same risks and they're not the same risks. Um, and I think it's very important. I mean, we could go into more questions to be proactive using lubrication, using vaginal estrogen when you're starting to have these symptoms. Because if you only address it with your doctor 10 years down the line, then we have to backtrack. We have to do the vaginal estrogen. I start prescribing dilators. I prescribe physical therapy. It just, it's, it's just going to be that much harder. So I want to, you know, I try to encourage all my patients to be very proactive in terms of vaginal dryness. Right, which is, I think, just to make the point, which is true probably for all aspects of what we're talking about, which right. is to say, just because something is normal doesn't mean it's not treatable, right? It's okay that this is something that could be expected for most women to experience, but that doesn't mean you have to live with it as is. We can still, um, we can improve things. Shani, welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. So uh, here in Israel, a little off with regard to the hours. I just wanted to add, to add, I'm sure Rifki addressed this, but with regard to vaginal dryness, and especially with estrogen creams, and it is very, very common for women to experience again pinkish discharge that just from multiple experiences, women then think during their shebanikim, their seven clean days, and women think that when they see on their underwear, they get very nervous. What is this intermittent staining? So uh, just to be very conscious of this, that in most of the cases, it really is, is really discharge. And uh, very often, if you let it dry, you'll even see that it turns into more of a brownish color. And even if it is due to dryness, really causing some staining, the staining is considered dam maka. It's considered due to uh, some type of uh, a blemish or some type of uh, basically of, uh, a, uh, of literally a wound in the body. And therefore, that is not considered damiza, even though it's coming from the vaginal area. So we have to keep that in mind from a halachic perspective. Yes, that is super helpful. Super, super helpful. And a woman might want to consider wearing a liner or something like that to sort of alleviate any of the discomfort she might have, both from a halachic perspective and from a, just the hygienic perspective. It might be more comfortable for her, for sure. Okay, thank you. So if we're ready, Shani, you missed my intro of you. I said... 
all wonderful things. I really could have said full shavach because right, the rule is miksa shavach befana. When the person's not, when the person is there, you can only give you know incomplete shavach. You weren't here though. I should have really, I should have spent more time introducing you because there's so much to say. We're so honored that you're here. Thank it's you. Really an honor and pleasure to be here, and especially with you, Rifki, and with Mallory, and a really a wonderful opportunity to deal with perimenopause and menopause, which, as we know, really opens up so many questions that. And so I would say even today's age, we really women sometimes were embarrassed to ask or didn't know what to ask or didn't know many of these issues. So this is a phenomenal opportunity for Nishma to offer really this class to ask all your questions, a wonderful opportunity. And I see that a question is coming in. Okay, Rifki, the moderator. Yes, I'm actually just gonna mention one thing before I read this question. Um, and that is I have found in general over the last number of years, we're making lots of improvements all over um, the firm world, the world in general, just being more aware, being more educated about challenges that people experience so that women, men, everyone who's experiencing a challenge because of the, the positives of social media and just online access to information that people don't have to feel like they're um, suffering alone or that there's something atypical or abnormal about their experience. What I also noticed is as much as there have been really a, a, a burst of, of resources for younger women um, dealing with things like infertility, PCOS, all, just a BRCA, BRCA testing, you know, the organizations, social media accounts, the area where I have seen, I think, the least um, attention is in this stage of life for women. Um, perimenopause, menopause, and women have shared with me that they think that's not just true physiologically, medically, they also think it's true stage of life. You know, what happens when the children move out? What happens when the children get married, God willing, and have their own families? And all that's into, we spend so much time. And I think part of that's um, related to the the ages of the people who have started the social media accounts and who are, who are really, doing an incredible job of creating online support for people. And this is definitely an area where I think we could all use some chizuk, some strength. So I'm really grateful to Nishma um, and to our presenters, of course, for uh, for making this happen. Okay, um, we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna start, like Shani said, I'm gonna start with the one that just came in um, and then we'll go to some of the other ones that we have. Okay, so this woman shares that I'm almost 46 and I've been experiencing irregular bleeding for a while now. Recently, I've had bleeding starting a day after returning from the mikvah. Oof. I had spotting before and checked with a rabbi who said it was okay, but after returning from the mikvah, it started bleeding more heavily. This caused me a lot of anxiety, thinking that I had sex after being after going to the mikvah while I was actually in Nida. What's the best way to handle this? Wow. Okay. So thank you so so much for your question. This is not an easy thing to uh, to be going through. So should we have? Dr. Allman, you want to just address it from a medical perspective? So I'll address it in medical. So one is that sounds like definitely uh, bleeding less than 21 days. So the first thing I'm going to do is you need to call your gynecologist. Um, um, but don't panic. It doesn't mean anything is wrong. Um, the most important things that we would do at this stage is do an ultrasound. Um, it might be due, the bleeding could be due, due to polyps. You could have polyps of the cervix, polyps of the uterus, uh, which are usually very benign. Um, or it could be to fibroids, or it could just be the stage being perimenopausal. But all those needs to be ruled out. Um, I'm going to definitely say um, after the ultrasound, it is recommended that you get a biopsy to make sure that there's no underlying precancerous cells of the uterus, um, which uh, Rifka and I could talk about if that puts you in Nita. But um, so definitely do get a biopsy. If everything is negative, if there are no polyps of the uterus or no fibroids that need to be treated, um, and you are over the course, this is happening over a few months and you're getting very frustrated, you always feel like you're Anita, this is a great time, even though you might not have taken birth control pills, we could put you, and I would recommend patients going on a low dose birth control pills to get them over this hump of a few months, be it a year, be it two years, to just regulate their bleeding. So that's one, that's one aspect. If there's nothing that needs treatment, okay? If there's polyps or fibroids, and that's a discussion that we would recommend possibly treating that. But if we don't see anything, and we think it's just the huge fluctuation of hormones, um, the easiest thing we could offer usually is if they have don't smoke or don't have high blood pressure, 
um, low dose birth control pills, which is very, very safe even in your 40s. That's one. There are others we could offer a Mirena IUD is another aspect, but there are different hormonal um, options to regulate your period during this stage so you don't feel like you're always in need of. How's it? Amazing. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Shani. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to address the uh, the first part that uh, Dr. Altman related to. And then Ricky, I'm going to say well. chime in that this woman is sharing that she she does have an IUD. She has a Paragard IUD. Okay. So if you have a Paragard IUD, even though you had normal cycles up until now, things change. Your body is not like a clock. Um, you know, we, our bodies change. And just because you had regular periods up until now, and now you don't, the first thing I'm going to tell you is take out your IUD. Before you do a whole workup, before we do biopsies, take out the IUD, see what happens with your menses. And I'm going to tell you, probably your bleeding is going to be much better. Why suddenly you're having irregular bleeding with the IUD? I think it's more the fluctuation, but the IUD definitely will contribute to that irregular bleeding. So before you do, before you even do a major workup, I still recommend the ultrasound, take out the IUD and see what happens the following month. Amazing. Thank Valerie, thank you. Because I was just going to mention that this is a very, very common question and very often related, particularly to uh, IUDs. So uh, Again, after all those experiencing this and you're thinking you're all alone in this, this is very common. And uh, just as Dr. Alt Altman mentioned as well, I generally say if it's a one month experience, wait to see what happens next time around, meaning not to shift your entire medical treatment and, and life and appointments because of this sometimes, you know, very difficult experience. But if it's already, you find that this is the second time that it's happened, it's recurring, then definitely to take out the IUD and then to begin to explore the other options that were mentioned on a halakhic basis. This is a very, very important question on many levels. Firstly, as you mentioned, to uh, first they ask to see whether or not the blood even renders you nida. As you saw from consulting with Arav, very often, based on how you see it, when you see it, and all these factors are going to be significant, especially if it was after you went to the mikvah, your halachic status is rendered as one as the cheskat tahara. You, uh, again, it's much more difficult to make you nida, to make you tmeya at that point. So that's always very important to mention as opposed to seeing it as difficult as it is during the seven clean days. Again, that's also mention, you know, when, when it occurs as such, also, if it's after the mikvah, to uh, to recognize that one should already be in colored underwear at that point. So always just a halachic recommendation after you finish your seven clean days, even if it's before you actually immersed in the mikvah, recommend it to switch to colored underwear. You have no more requirements, again, not to stay in the white. And for those who were wearing color the entire time, so uh, all the more so. And to uh, recognize that whatever you see on colored, really doesn't count unless it turns into a flow. So just as you said, sometimes it does turn again a little heavier. And this is always very difficult because then a woman is in limbo because tamim, the stains, we can technically halachically ignore. A flow is much more difficult. However, a flow really means continuous, not just spotting, and the continuous staining of a significant amount. Usually Rabbanim today use the terminology of a credit card size or if you would, hypothetically, the Gemara uses the term more, if you would put your head between your legs and you would actually see blood coming out. So I generally tell women, especially after mikvah, try to avoid that. But there are many women in this situation where they're seeing staining and they still feel very guilty engaging in intimate relations by virtue of the fact that, number one, they're afraid they're actually going to see after relations. And that is a more halakhically difficult situation, knowing that they had relations when technically she had blood. And, and therefore, there are numerous both, I'm going to mention psychological, but also halakhic ways to uh, almost uh, ease and definitely ameliorate a lot of the compunctions that women feel. Number one, to know that halakhically staining and as long as it's seen uncolored, on something that's not makabel tum'ah, and on something that is made of synthetic fibers, for example, is 
does not render you nida. So even though it's very difficult, and yes, you're allowed to engage in relations. It may make you feel better psychologically to rinse yourself out, to wash yourself out without looking, and then engage, and then extremely recommended halachically not to look after relations, at least within a five, 10 minutes after relations, not just you, but also your spouse, to tell them when they wash themselves off, not to look. Now, many women feel that this is cheating the system, but it's not. It's actually called working within the halachic system, where now you understand that if you saw blood 10 minutes after relations, and in, once again, a manner of seeing on stains, let's say you went to the bathroom, you waited a few seconds, used toilet paper, which according to most post game, also, if you see blood on toilet paper, it doesn't render you a nida, then, and then you're actually fine, even though you know that there's blood. Uh, if you saw within, let's say right after relations, then you do have to assume that that blood came due to relations. And then not only are you a nida, but that really is a, a difficult state. Some women prefer, even if they really are staining, they're not sure if the staining is turning into a flow. Very often it's recommended to wait, wait a little while, see if the staining is getting heavier, if it's getting lighter. And without rendering oneself a nida, without stating or changing one's status, to uh, again have touching, kissing, but maybe not to engage in relations until one sees what the both the state of the stains are and therefore what one's halachic status is. I want to give one final recommendation as well, and that is that particularly after the mikvah is in Israel, we would call this basa, right? That you see blood right after and you became Torah and now you're tmeya again, and it's very, very difficult. Well, if you saw the blood while you were still in the mikvah and you have not gone home yet and enough blood to make you anida, then it's as if you didn't immerse. And knowing that you didn't have relations, all you need really is to start your seven clean days again. If you came home, even if your husband wasn't at home at that time, but he could have been home, certainly if you had relations, but even if you didn't, but you could have had, the halacha is that then you have to wait, certainly according to Ashkenazim, Sparadim are more lenient with this, but Ashkenazim wait again five days plus the seven clean days again. So an important distinction to make. And now I'm glad that that Valerie had mentioned all the different forms though, it could also be not only one with IUDs, but as mentioned, it could be polyps. And it's important then to also to always ask the doctor, are you opening up a sufficient amount? Can you prove that the blood came from the polyp or the fibroid and not necessarily from the uterine lining, right? These are important questions to ask. And based on that, to see whether or not those procedures will render you a nida. And Rivki, maybe you wanna fill in on some of the different effects of birth control on women undergoing menopause, meaning some of the advantages and disadvantages. Valerie already mentioned them medically, so maybe halakhically. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think before I even get to the birth control um, piece, I just wanna mention one thing that um, women have shared with me has been very helpful that I've shared with them, um, which I'm really just relaying information from Rabbi Alman, who is one of our post game, certainly my post -ache, um, but the, the post -ache really for, um, for the US Ed program in the United States, at least. Um, and one thing that he has shared in situations, as Shani mentioned, we will sometimes advise couples we won't tell them it's halacha, but it might be advisable for a woman who is actively staining a problematic color. Obviously, we're only really talking about pinks, reds, something in black. If we're in the realm of brown, then this is a whole other, much more lenient conversation. There's nothing to talk about with browns. But if we're in the realm of red, so the the advice, the halachic advice, not, not demands, but the halachic advice would be that the couple should abstain until the staining has, has subsided. Um, that works if you know the staining is going on for a day or two or three, uh, but certainly for women who have shorter and shorter windows of times when they are considered tahora, this can get very, very stressful. And so Rabbi Alman has told me to share with women, what he recommends is that if a couple is in this stage where it's continuing for a number of days and it's not reasonable or realistic for them to abstain for longer, um, then we're always encouraging as much as possible for couples to be able to be together. So he recommends that the woman who is having the staining issue go into the bathroom and not do anything internal, nothing, nothing internal, but just to take toilet paper or a tissue and do an external wipe and see if she's actively staining at that moment. If she, if she is, 
then we have to follow all the guidelines that Shani mentioned, which are good practice in general during all stages of a couple's life, to just be a little bit careful about not looking, cleaning themselves off with color things, color towels or whatever, not looking in good light or, you know, waiting certainly a few minutes at least um, after they finished having relations. But certainly for a woman who's been staining, if what she sees is a non-problematic color or she sees that there's nothing happening in that moment, she can take a deep breath, she can exhale a bit and hopefully be able to enjoy, be a little bit more carefree um, in her ability to be with her husband. And again, if she's staining a problematic color, then that's a different conversation and the couple needs to you know, discuss it and decide what they're comfortable doing. But just that that's sometimes a good way of, um, of gauging whether this is a, you know, a safer or perhaps less safe time for the couple um, to engage in relations. Okay, so I just wanted to share that in addition to all the wisdom we already heard. Um, I think before I get into the birth control, which I hope we'll address, there are a couple of other things that have come up that I just want to make sure we address um, that are very perimenopause related. I know the birth control issue can also be perimenopause related, but just wanted to, um, to get your thoughts on the following. Um, I think Dr. Allman already addressed this one, which um, is to say that a woman can have, you know, be experiencing so many symptoms from during this stage of life. Um, and so at what point should the woman seek treatment? I think you already commented on that, but I would like you to just elaborate a little bit more if possible. And also, um, when do you bring in outside or additional professionals like a pelvic physio or physical therapist, um, sex therapist, things like that, if you want to just um, address that, if you can. Right. So it's all, it all depends, you know, when somebody, when a woman comes in for their annual, so there's always the set questions, you know, your mammogram, your screening, your colonoscopy, your bone, be it bone density, if you're ready in menopause, um, and your last pap smear, your sexual activity. And um, usually when women are in the perimenopausal stage, you want to ask about relations. If there, I usually try to ask if there's any issues um, with sexual activity. Are they having any vaginal dryness? Very often women don't volunteer it. Um, you sometimes just have to ask it or they volunteer it as you're walking out the door. That is um, so um, in terms of when to seek care. Well, one is as women are in their 40s, definitely if they've been through childbirth, um, all the urinary incontinence um, and the feeling pressure, that is all very common. And that's as you enter your 40s, your 50s, certainly the lack of estrogen contributes to it, contributes to more frequent urinary tract infections. Um, so if somebody is having um, urinary issues, then I definitely, I refer them to a urogynecologist. Um, if they have a lot of pain with intercourse and you've already the vaginal dryness, um, physical therapy always helps. It's a great addition. I'm a big fan of pelvic floor therapy. Um, I, um, you, you give the vaginal estrogen, um, but in addition, if already, if a woman is feeling pain with intercourse, um, I definitely think um, visiting a pelvic floor specialist that specializes in what we call dyspareunia, which means painful intercourse, really um, is a must. Like I said, they're only, you're in your 40s. You still hopefully will have relations. Everybody should live till a long, uh, you know, for many, many years. So hopefully you'll have relations with your husband or your partner until your 70s, 80s. Um, you know, it, I, I get very sad sometimes when women say in their 60s, it's too painful. I stopped having intercourse. And I, I so wish that they would have addressed it 10 years earlier to not be at this stage in their 60s. Um, so then definitely that's a, for physical therapy, um, sex therapy, certainly the decreased libido is a big issue. Um, you know, it's an issue we all deal with. I wish I had easy answers for decreased libido. I do not. Um, there is no great quick fix for decreased libido. We don't have an instant pill. Hormone replacement therapy might help. Certainly the aspect of decreased libido, if you are having, you know, the whole cycle of, if you're having pain with intercourse because of vaginal dryness, then you start fearing having intercourse and then there's less willingness to have intercourse. So it's a cycle that gets perpetuated. Um, so certainly you wanna treat the vaginal dryness, 
but there's definitely a decreased libido for most women in their 40s. There's a lot of psychological change that happens. There's increased anxiety with menopause. Um, and therefore, if a patient really, you know, um, it's hard, it's hard to convince the patients, but to refer them to a sex therapist. Most gynecologists, we do not do sex therapy, but I do think um, that there's benefit. If a woman also to understand that if they have starting the depression and the anxiety, one is it is menopause, it is common, but it's very, I don't like to attribute all these symptoms to just menopause. So I definitely think it's very important to do a proper analysis of all the symptoms that are related to anxiety and depression and refer to the appropriate therapist that they might or psychiatrist. You could start on hormone replacement therapy to help those symptoms, but I don't, I, I, I try not to, I don't like women always attributing everything to just being perimenopausal or menopausal. I think a proper investigation to maybe there's other things going on that should be treated and not ignored. So in conjunction, I will support them, um, but definitely to make sure to have the proper referrals. Absolutely. It's a, team. it's a team. It takes a team <laughs> to treat all the different things. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Shani, what, what would you like to add? We don't hear you. Oh, I think you got muted. Okay. No, it says that your microphone is off. Wait, are you back? Am I back? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. So uh, firstly, Dr. Ullman, I want to thank you on behalf of all the women, not only just the ones listening, but all the women out there, and both uh, during, as you said, perimenopause, menopause, and throughout their lives to know how important it is to see a pelvic floor specialist. And there are women who have told me that, and whether it's vaginal dryness, whether it's any type of pain whatsoever, and even after a visit or two, and definitely, and the professional pelvic floor specialist who can also know when there are certain psychosomatic symptoms as well to address this, again, it can make the difference in really in, in their lives, in intimacy. So, so thank you for that. And on that note, what many women don't realize is that even after speaking to their gynecologist, even after recognizing that intimacy is less pleasurable than it was before, so many of them just think to themselves, okay, this is the stage in life and I must embrace it right now. What they don't realize is that this is actually also a halachic issue, namely that there is a mitzvah on the man called mitzvah ona which uh, according to uh, the Ramban, the Ramban, and this is how we pass in the Mita Uraita, on a biblical level, a man has the requirement to provide his wife, not just with what's called she'er and kasut, with food and clothing, but also with the mitzvah of ona, which is not just intercourse, but with sexual pleasure. And there are plenty of sources to add uh, to corroborate this. And what's beautiful is that many of the, again, Rishonim, Achronim, again, modern day poskim speak about the importance thereof to add to marriage and as not only a spiritual covenant, but definitely a, a physically oriented one as well that is meant to, to strengthen that. And therefore people say, oh, it's okay. I don't experience pleasure. So I'll just live out as uh, Dr. Altman said, you know, the rest of the years with, um, with a lowered libido and no, there's, there is what to do about this. And uh, both uh, certainly sex therapists, but also treatments and a uh, pelvic floor specialist. And this is not only for your own uh, psychological state, but halachic state as well to understand a little bit about the male female sexual response to learn this to ensure that the halacha is going to be observed more. So it's really an imperative to try to experience as much sexual pleasure as one can. Right. I think sometimes people need the added encouragement of making that phone call, making that appointment, 
especially when you're we're asking them very often i find to make multiple appointments and make multiple phone calls and have multiple follow-ups with multiple professionals um definitely knowing that the torah is there you know pushing you forward that definitely helps thank you shani thank you so much um okay yes and there's a pelvic floor pt who is on who is grateful for the uh the shout out i don't know about you shani but i think that's the referral that i make most often um, when I'm speaking to a woman, and this is at literally every stage of a woman's life, whether I'm studying with a young woman before she gets married um, and has you know no sexual experience or a woman who has lots of sexual experience but has had a baby and now everything is all topsy turvy upside down and her sex life is you know not what it was um, and to you know certainly into the perimenopausal menopausal stage. So yes, we're we're big fans of pelvic PTs. Thank you. Um, speaking of which, both yeah. for those who wanted to know how to contact a Yoetzet and and to us. So the answer is through the Nishmat website. Again, it's really the best way. And speaking of pelvic floor specialists, again, there are lists online, but also speaking to your Yoetzet, both of the best is obviously with regard to convenience to have someone who's nearby that it's convenient for you to go for regular visits and therefore best to speak to your most local Yoetzet who will know the best pelvic floor specialist in the area or to Dr. Altman, who I'm sure can refer you to, uh, to various professionals as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit um, to something that not every woman experiences, but what many women do experience, which is um, excessive bleeding that might be caused by fibroids or, um, or other anomalies. So this one woman, she had her fibroids removed, but there was clearly some kind of other cause for very heavy uterine bleeding that she was experiencing. Her doctor is recommending an ablation, um, which maybe Dr. Rollman will explain to everyone what that is, recommending an ablation. And she has heard mixed reviews. I've shared my experience of hearing from both sides of either ablation versus a hysterectomy. So I'm wondering if um, Dr. Rollman, you can address both of those procedures and then Shani, if you want to address them also and like what the halachic ramifications would be. So, yeah, so um, hysterectomy is, you know, complete treatment. You're not going to bleed anymore, but it is major surgery. Um, I mean, it's still, we do now laparoscopic hysterectomies if the uterus is um, not so big, and that's outpatient surgery at this stage, but it's still major, major surgery. Um, it's definitive management. So if a patient, one is if there's any risk of precancer cells, cancer, or um, they are sufficiently very, very anemic, their blood count is low because they're bleeding so heavily, and you need more or less definitive management, then that's the hysterectomy. An ablation, um, I think ablation is a great treatment. Um, it doesn't always work. So if somebody is in their, they're 48, and they might go into menopause in two, three years, and this is a holding pattern, um, and they don't want major surgery. Ablation is outpatient surgery. Um, what we do is we basically burn the lining of your uterus. Um, and there are two types mostly. The most common type is something called HTA, hydrothermal ablation. Um, it's down as an outpatient. The whole procedure takes about a half hour. Um, the problem is it probably, I'll say the success rate is about 50, 60%. Um, so I'm a big believer of doing less first. So I wouldn't re probably recommend first an ablation and then move on if that fails uh, to hysterectomy. Um, but ablation cannot be done if somebody has a very large uterus that's measuring as if they're 20 weeks pregnant from huge fibroids, ablation will not work. Um, this is for somebody who has almost a normal or slightly larger uterus. Um, the cavity should, you know, if there are polyps there, the polyps should, re you could remove the polyps at the same time of the procedure um, and then do the ablation. For some patients, I will do I would remove the polyps, or if it's a fibroid growing in, a fibroid is actually, the uterus is made up of two types of tissue. One is the lining that you shed every month, and the outer part, which is majority of the uterus, is a muscle layer. It's a different type of cell. So a fibroid is a growth of the muscle part of the uterus that grows into what we call a submucosal fibroid, grows into the cavity of the 
uterus, and that could cause a lot of heavy bleeding. So we could actually remove a portion of that vaginally. So it's outpatient procedure, no incision on the belly. So you could remove the submucosal myoma, remove the polyps, do an ablation, and then put a Mirena IUD in. <laughs> so I've done, and it's all done within an hour or two at best patient has no limitations except no intercourse for two weeks. They could exercise the next day. And, you know, so you could do all that. It's a very, it's outpatient procedure with very, very little risk um, to hopefully decrease someone's bleeding. Um, just if somebody does have an ablation, it's controversial about getting pregnant afterwards because um, it does disrupt the lining of the uterus. There are some there's been a, quite a few studies that it's been okay, but it's controversial. Um, it's not, I would not recommend doing um, an ablation if somebody's still considering childbearing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Shani. Excellent. Okay. So now the halachic implications of those, those procedures. So um, as mentioned, the, the uh, hysterectomy is going to remove the uterus, which on one hand means that after this, no more, no more nita, no more blood, which I just want to mention as well. Sometimes for women, it's a little bit of a shock emotionally as well. This is a time that I, uh, I encourage women to reach out to a yoete to also discuss the transition of bidding farewell to the mikvah. But on the most basic halachic level, it's also important with regard to timing to understand what your halachic status is. If uh, the hysterectomy is done while you're seeing blood that renders you anita, meaning while there definitely is uterine blood, then you have to, after the procedure, wait till the blood stops and, and then count your seven clean days and then go to the mikvah, which basically is going to be your farewell mikvah. If, and at times, sometimes this really is beyond your control, that it's scheduled after the bleeding has stopped, after the bleeding has stopped, and let's say you're in the middle of your seven clean days, and uh, same thing, you have to see how much bleeding there is with regard to whether or not it actually is going to cancel the clean days. Sometimes you have to start the clean days over again, but very often, and it really is at times just the staining, but you need those seven clean days before going to the mikvah. The more complicated is when you've already gone to the mikvah. So technically, because what the procedure is doing is removing your uterus together with the uterine blood, and that there, even if there isn't, actual blood, very often there is, but even when there isn't, we assume that there is. And therefore, for one last time, basically, if you didn't see any blood, we assume that there could have been, and then you wait seven clean days. So uh, you don't necessarily have to wait five days, but seven clean days. Some women even seeing a little bit of blood, this is when it definitely is worthwhile to consult with a, with a rav, with a yowetza talacha, to see whether those five days are necessary before counting the seven clean days. And even if some of you are saying, why should I even become a nita through this procedure, as mentioned, because we're removing the uterine blood, the seven clean days are necessary. I find that women sometimes appreciate this transition from knowing that after this, that really is going to be the end of their of their nida period. So that's something to to keep in mind with regard to abla the uh, ablations. So very important to note as well that because it's on one hand the uh, bottom of the uterine lining, which is basically being being affected, being being burned, being uh, and not being treated over there, they're very often and it won't be heavy bleeding, but I'm sure Dr. Altman can, can corroborate this. Very often there is bleeding. Sometimes though, it's not even coming from the actual uterine lining. Sometimes it's just coming from the external os, the external cervix. And therefore very important once again, to always consult with your medical practitioner, to consult with your gynecologist and ask, if I see blood, right, can you tell me where the blood is coming from? They may say, Sometimes it is coming from the uterine lining. That's the area that we just treated. And again, same idea. If you see it as ketamim, if you see it as stains, then wearing colored, which is definitely recommended thereafter, and then you can ignore them. If, and very often, it will be heavier, it can even come as a flow, then to, well, Olvia tried to, to avoid that, then it's important to consult once again with your medical practitioner and with a rabbinical consultant 
to see whether or not it's considered dam maka, whether we can prove that it really is just because of the ablation or whether it really is coming from the uterus itself. And based on that, we'll determine whether the woman is a nida. Out therefore, the timing of the surgery is significant as well, because if it's timed during the seven clean days, sometimes it can be very difficult for a woman to then complete the seven clean days with even, even being makil, even being lenient, with just a badika, let's say, on the first day and the seventh day. Sometimes it can be very difficult from personal experience. I see women for whom after their ablations, that's really what they're struggling with, getting through the seven clean days and then not to get a clean badika. So again, at times we'll send her to a gynecologist, a gynecological nurse to see in fact what the source of the blood is. But if, that, if we can't determine that it's coming from a maka, from some type of wounds, then she has to wait. And sometimes it actually is very good for obviously the recuperation as well for her to wait until she does another badika and to wait for the mikvah. The best time then for one to really have an ablation is when one is becheska tahara, after one has gone to the mikvah, hopefully whatever bleeding has stopped and therefore you can attribute whatever bleeding you see really to the makkah and to some type of, again, if we know, and especially if it's staining, even heavy staining, we can rely or what's called din We can relate to what the procedure itself as damaka and be lenient with that blood. Thank you both so much. Okay, I see we really we only have two minutes left. So I'm just quickly, Dr. Alman, and then Shani, hopefully we'll have time to hear from you also. Um, can you comment on for a woman who has tested positive for BRCA and she knows she is making decisions about removal of her ovaries, removal of her uterus potentially, um, maybe. Um, can you comment on, would there be reasons to do multiple removals at once versus doing them in stages, um, handling the side effects, um, what right. the difference will be. I mean, we're basically talking about no perimenopause in this situation we're talking right. about. Right, you're going straight into menopause. I'm gonna be honest. So um, the side effects after the surgery, discarding like recuperation from surgery is gonna be your menopausal state, mm -hmm. um, the abrupt going into menopause. Removing the uterus, there's no real si side effects except the emotional fact that you removed your uterus um, where hopefully, you know, you, your children, you know, a fetus grows, like you're, you lost all chi childbearing um, potential. So, but, so there's no, I don't, I don't see the reason to take out ovaries and tubes. Um, the only reason to keep a uterus, if you're looking, if you froze, you have embryos and you're still considering getting pregnant um, and you froze embryos. Um, that's the only reason to keep your uterus still. If you are done with childbearing and the recommendations take her to uterus, tubes, and ovaries, it should be done all at the same time. There's no reason to break up the procedures. Um, the only reason really is, is if you have frozen embryos, um, you definitely could um, keep your uterus to be um, to for childbearing. Um, I think it's more the psychological aspect that you deal with. Um, going, it is abrupt menopause. Um, and then going on hormone replacement, going on vaginal estrogen, that's something you need to discuss with the medical oncologist. Um, I don't make usually those decisions. Okay, so helpful. Thank you, Shani. In the minute or so that we have left, what do you okay. have to share with so us? Very quickly, so Rifki, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity because seven years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, even though I was BRCA negative. And as Dr. Altman said, Whatever treatment is recommended, especially because most breast cancers, not all, are estrogen sensitive. So I recommended to even chemically put a woman into menopause, which is the experience that I had. So I can definitely relate to many of these questions and again, the transition, but the abruptness is also, as uh, as mentioned, very difficult in terms of all of a sudden, and not, not just the, the hot flashes and not just uh, many of the side effects that come with uh, with menopause as discussed, but also the farewell, you know, to uh, to mikvah, the halachic implications as well. So, for example, with lucrin, lucrin treatment, which basically inhibits the uh, the estrogen receptors and and uh, and uh, hormonal effects on the body, and a woman will will get lighter and then 
ultimately no periods at all. So I just want to address this again, as, as Dr. Altman said, emotionally, again, very important to, to recognize this change, certainly to, uh, to seek both, uh, both counsel guidance support and also halachic issues that come up. For example, as Rivki mentioned at the beginning, the ideas of the satot, your patterns of blood seeing are going to change. And this is a, a clear Mishnah that once you're, once you're at a certain age and, and your periods stop after you have no periods at all for, for three months or basically three cycles, meaning three regular cycles in a row, you're considered as kina, you're considered then misulaketamim, a woman who's not expecting to see blood. And if obviously with the hysterectomy, then it's automatic. You know already that the next month you're not expecting to see blood. You don't have to look out for seeing blood. If you do see blood, it's not going to be uterine blood because you don't have a uterus. It's supposed to. If you do have a uterus and you're still having staining, especially at the regular time that you generally do, even if it's light staining, so especially because at the time of your veset, known as your ona, that particular 12-hour period, you're required to perform a bedika, an internal exam, before resuming relations. So very often, a woman will then become a nida nonetheless uh, to realize that it's important to keep track of these cycles because after not experiencing them, for three months in a row, then the woman does not have to worry about becoming Nida. Anyway, I'll tell you from a personal experience as well, after five years on Lucrin, then being taken off of Lucrin, I didn't have to worry about any issues of Nida. All of a sudden, four months later, I started to get periods again, which means all of a sudden I go back to being what's called a Ba'alat Ri'iyatamim, a woman who then does start seeing blood. And then from then on, really does have to keep track of the patterns of the satot once again and the various onot of the onata flaga and the ona benonit and the onata chodesh. So Rivki, thank you for that opportunity. Yes, thank you both so, so much. There is so much to talk about. I think this was the beginning of a conversation and obviously not a not the open and close of a conversation. So we are so grateful for your questions and grateful to all of you who joined us. And of course, the most grateful to our presenters Thank you, Dr. Valerie Altman and Yuatzad al Hashani Targan. This was a really a wonderful opportunity. You taught us so much. And I think hopefully we, like I said, opened the conversation that will encourage women to reach out to their medical professionals and reach out to their halakhic advisors to get the information and the help that, um, that can actually make a difference. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you to our wonderful moderator, Rifki. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.